so it's hardiness. I actually like to be on time. But about 30 minutes left into this journey, my GPS decides to give out. And I turn off my phone and turn it back on, and nothing worked. <laughs> so I just started to go, Lord, the church is Brooksville. So I'm just going to follow every sign that says Brooksville. <laughs> and got close enough to where, I don't know, the GPS did this thing where I could see where the church is and where my car is. But there was nothing else on the screen, just two dots. So I was like, I'm just going to follow the dot and just, you know, until it gets, you know, close. And just keep going in that area. Um, I think that's kind of like also like our walk with Christ, right? Many times things kind of give out, but you know the end goal, I mean, it's there. Yeah. So now I'm just going to keep moving forward towards that direction, right? Um, so I'm thankful for that life application. <laughs> um, before we continue, I'd like to have a word of prayer. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the blessing that it is Lord, to be your child. More than that, Father, we are your children. We thank you for the Sabbath day as a reminder of your grace, Lord. There is we don't take no part in creation, but we are a part of creation. And the fact that what we produce and what we can offer and what we can give um, in this day, Lord, just ceases and we just rest in you. Lord, I want to thank you, Father, for this opportunity to open up your word. I ask that you open our hearts and our minds to receive it. Uh, help us to understand it as well, Lord. And give us clarity. Um, and help us just enjoy this, this act of worship, Father. Actually, all these things in your son Jesus saying that. Amen. Amen. So, for those that may not know me, um, I feel like this is the first time we get to meet. This is a pleasure of mine. My name is Pastor Rifelo Montalvo, and I work with SALT Outreach. I'm an outreach pastor for SALT, and SALT stands for Service and Love Together. Who's heard of SALT? Oh, nice. So, SALT is pretty much an organization that is faith-based. Uh, all the leaders are at Venice. Uh, we're all just young, uh, say, on fire for the Lord, but really doing something for the community as well, in which we work with the homeless outreach in Central Florida. So our permanent, our focus is, and we don't even like to say homeless, right? I like to say what the title of the sermon is, homebound, right? We say the homebound, because they're bound to have a home, right? They're bound to not be in this space. And so our, our objective is really, how can we end this experience of homelessness, right? Because they're homebound. How do we give back dignity to a population that is overseen many times, right? There's overlooked, not cared for. Um, and so what we have is this little organization is growing, and I praise God for it. Uh, we have a shower trailer, a laundry trailer, everything's normal. Everything's mobile, and on a daily basis, we get to help out, I see personally, uh, around 80 people a day that come in. 80 people a day that get a shower. You know, many times preaching the gospel doesn't have to be right here with a suit, you know, looking like a lawyer. Many times preaching the gospel is giving somebody a towel, giving somebody the opportunity to take a shower, cleaning their clothes, feeding them. That uh, you don't understand like how beautiful it is to build that relationship with someone and then be like, hey, do you want to go to a Bible study? And being able for that person not to build this relationship, know their names, and have the Bible studies. I can say that God has been moving greatly. In the past month, we were able to baptize three people. Yeah. And that's so we often just building relationships. Building relationships. And so my passage for today. So we're from Matthew chapter 25, and um, it's a very interesting passage because it's, it's, it's one that's heavy. So when you read Matthew 25, it cannot be separated from Matthew 24. Like these two chapters go together. Right? The, the question that starts everything is the disciples asking Jesus, when will all these things come to pass? Right? When will the end come? And the end of the ages and the, you know, they, they want to know, when will this end? Give us like a little, little heads up. Right? The thing about it is that the question of the disciples is the same question we have today. Many people have this question still. When will this end? 
right? We see the signs of the times and the news and, you know, all these things. It's like, but when will this end, right? Maybe so that I could be ready. Or maybe I live my life and I know when things end. And now right at the end, I can turn around and get things right with God. But Jesus says, listen, don't worry about when will I come. Know that I will come. I will come. There is no if, ands, or buts about it. I will come. The question now is, how will I find you when I come? That's the question. And then he begins to lay out almost, this is how I want to find you. Like I'm giving you almost like a tip on how to be ready. So when you read Matthew 24 and 25, he begins to give the warnings of the false messiahs and the wars and the rumors of wars, and how this is the beginning of the birth pains, comparing it to contractions. And then later on towards the end, he begins to give these parables and parables and parables and parables and parables. Notice in the parables, each of them, the two main words that keep repeating in each parable is stay awake and be ready. Stay awake and be ready. Stay awake and be ready. Right? And there's different forms of staying awake and be ready, but they're all, each parable is a different form of staying awake and being ready. But the last parable, it's interesting because sometimes we take these parables and isolate them, you know, and that's cool, that's fine. But actually, each parable is a chain link together of how to stay ready and how to stay awake. And the last one is kind of like the, 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 the one that's really just, what we're going to study today. The last one begins like this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. You can talk, I don't like it. It's interesting that this parable starts off with the second coming, meaning that this parable is very different from the other parables, in that this parable is actually prophetic. This parable hasn't happened yet. That means that when you read this parable, you're actually reading about yourself. You're reading about yourself. And what will we be? We'll be the sheep. We'll be the goats. It's interesting that we, um, we focus a lot on prophecy many times, at least when I grew up. I mean, when I grew up, I grew up in a very Hispanic church. And it was, you know, prophecy, 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 prophecy. And, and sometimes it felt like a rock more than anything. I just, it was terrifying. And as I got older and I had to study for myself, the one thing I would say about prophecy is that it's an act of grace. Yeah. The fact that God is telling you beforehand things that will happen with the objective to believe in. Right? Jesus says these things. I tell you things beforehand so when they come to pass, you may believe. Now, prophecy has two definitions. I don't know if you knew that, but there's two definitions for prophecy, right, biblically. One is foretelling, which is the one that we kind of like know, so like Daniel, the Revelation, you know, the coming. But the other definition for prophecy is foretelling. It's what you see mostly in the Old Testament. You know what Jesus was doing when, God, when the Lord tells Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel, hey, prophesy this to the people. And then he just says what happens. Where he says the things that I listen that are happening in their community. He says, so, so forth, foretelling is the future. Foretelling is speaking as to what's going on in the community right now. And that one actually happens a lot more than the future. The foretelling. So what's interesting is here, this prophecy, that prophetic parable that Jesus is talking about. He's like, hey, listen. Pay close attention to this is actually talking about. Right? Don't lose the prophetic voice speaking about the future. Uh, or focus so much on the prophetic message talking about the future that you lose your prophetic voice as to what's going on right now. Because what's going on right now impacts our future. It's like the brick and mortar is laying the steps. For it. And so he's like, listen. I will separate the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And the king shall say to those on his right, Who's read this passage before? I mean, 
You've been to church long enough. I think you've heard this passage. Right? Come those who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Those are words I think all of us want to hear. Come, those who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom that's prepared for you way before this world was even formed. I've had you in mind. Come. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will answer to them, truly I say to you, you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. That's the sheep. Right? And it says the righteous. Right? And then the righteous respond. And it's interesting because it almost sounds like you can, somebody can read this very roughly and be like, oh, see, salvation by works. It's what you do that makes you righteous. And it's not. You see, the reason you know why Christ calls them righteous is because the actions they were doing, they didn't even realize they were doing it, impacting Christ. They were living out their relationship with Jesus. That is all. They had this relationship with Christ and they lived it out. They applied it to their lives. Imagine someone going to the gym. Imagine someone, tell me what would you think of someone that goes to the gym but never works out. What would you think about that person? Right? I go to the gym, but I never work out. I just go in there. If you were to ask them, do you go to the gym? What would they say? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. But they don't work out. And then a year later, they're actually more unfit than they were when they came in. And they're complaining about, man, I really want to get in shape. I always heard knowledge is power. And I don't believe that phrase. I know this old French philosopher said it. I don't agree with it. Right? Knowledge is information. That's what it is. But when you apply the knowledge, that's power. That's power. Right there. When you apply it, when you take what you learn and put it to practice, it doesn't matter how much, how, how big the knowledge or how little it is. A little bit that you know, apply that knowledge. That's power. Go to the gym, right? Go to the gym. By me being in the gym doesn't make me an athlete. The same way that by me being in the garage doesn't make me a car. The same way that being inside of a church makes me a Christian. It's when we apply it, when we begin to live it out. That's when the change begins. That's when we can actually have this relationship and begin to walk with Christ and begin to actually live out these principles that we're learning. That's the aspect where Christ comes like, I don't know if you knew this, but you're righteous. Because you're living out the relationship. I mean, you're doing it. Right? And it's much more than it's messy. I feel like it is messy because many times the experiences that I've had, I don't know, with my church, it was kind of like, well, we feed them and we give them a drink, and that's where it begins and ends. But Christ says, listen, like, you may not know who you're entertaining when you can have a conversation. I don't know, I was living in Alabama, I was studying for my undergrad for theology at Oakwood, and I lived, um, this was after I graduated, actually, right after. I got into an apartment, and I lived in this apartment where, like, you had to go through, like, gate, right? There was nothing fancy, but it was like a little gate, and I lived in the far back building. And then for you to get to my actual apartment, you had to go into the building, go up the stairs, go to the back of the building. So I lived in the back of the back of the back. Like, for you to find where I was, like, you needed a GPS that worked, not one I could just use per day. And one day, it's like 11 o'clock at night, and just... And I opened the door and this guy's like, hey, uh, does uh, Scott live here? I'm like, no, I'm Scott, it's 11 o'clock at night. 
And I noticed he didn't have shoes. And, you know, he was like, all right, you know, and it was like this awkward moment where it's like, uh, all right, you know. And I noticed, like, man, he doesn't have shoes. I shut the door, and I don't want to go sit on my couch, like, I'm gonna get my sandals. I run through the sandals, when I come out, there was nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. I don't know if I was thinking or not, I just don't know. But, it definitely brought this, this thought of, of like, who am I entertaining as I walk through this world? And how am I treating them? Because the reality is, how we treat people says a lot about our relationship with God. Right? How we treat people says a lot about our relationship with God. In fact, when we go down this passage, we gotta see like this relationship of, of grace and the law, obedience and faith all go together. They all go together. And so we look at this passage, continuing on, right? The sheep. Now he goes to the goats. And he says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It's interesting that the hell, right, or this concept of hell, right, because we know that hell is not a place right now. Hell is an event in time that will happen. It's like a concert that you really don't want to be a part of. Like, it's coming. And it's prepared for the devil and his angels. But humans will be in there. Like, there's no need for humans to be in there. It's prepared for the devil and his angels. But mankind will find its way in hell. And the reason why, this is my thoughts, it's because they're living a life more different than me. I like the way this one person put it, where it's like, God really wants to eliminate sin. Just sin is this wild beast that is roaming around. And it's almost like God has this rifle, which we know it's not rifle, but for the image. God has this rifle, and he has sin at the crosshairs. And at the moment he's about to pull the trigger, we see that mankind grabs this wild beast and just hugs it and holds on to it. So now God has a dilemma. It's like, how do I eliminate the thing I hate the most from the thing I love the most? Right? And that happens every single day with the decisions we make as we walk with God. But one day, God, I mean, He'll respect the decisions that we make to the point where it's like, okay, if this is what you want, then there you go. I won't force you into anything. The same way that these individuals were not forced, right, into sharing what they have. Sharing clothes, sharing food, something to drink. They just did it. It was literally a reflection of their relationship. They were in love. Anyone been in love? Where you just, I don't know, I can't describe the feeling. But it's a, well, you kind of can't describe the feeling. You talk about that to the point of nauseam to your friends, probably. You think about them, you want to get to know them better. I need to know all about that. You're learning, and then you're sharing. You're doing things, and that's literally this relationship right here. I mean, they walk by faith because they were in love. Again, we're reading about us when we read this passage. And the goats, I mean, the people that are symbolized as goats, they do the complete opposite. But they're believers. That's the kicker. That's the thing that threw me back. They're believers. They're like, God, when did we not minister to you? When did we see you like this and not do it? God's like, you, you did it. You did it. And it's not because you didn't see me, it's because you saw, when you saw these people, or you saw somebody that was in need, you didn't acknowledge it as myself. But that was me. That you, that you turned away, I looked away, did it be. They didn't need to drink, they didn't clothe, they didn't visit. That was me. But they're believers. When did we not minister to you? Lord, I came to church every Sabbath. I'm a fourth generation Adventist. When did I not? And Christ is just like, that. notice the pastor doesn't say, how 
did you treat inherit those that treated my law? It's like, how do you treat my people? Because how you treat people really indicates how you, if you really keep the law of God. Mm-hmm. It's like this, this, this relationship is, is this dynamic between grace and law. And I really want to share this. And I pray for clarity, hopefully, you know. This dynamic between law and grace, that's there, right? I, I remember reading one time in this book as I was studying, and it made so much sense. Let me know if this makes sense to you. Right? Try to picture this image with me. Imagine you're outside and it's raining. And it's raining and, and you don't really have to imagine too much. Florida is, has bipolar weather. So it rains and it stops raining. But now imagine it's pouring down, just raining, raining, raining. And you're outside and you're just getting beat by the rain. Um, the rain is the law of God. Right? The rain is the law of God and it's beating down. But then Jesus comes and gives us grace. Now that grace looks like an umbrella. What do you do with that umbrella? Right, you open it. You accept it first, <laughs> and then open it. And now you're under grace or under the umbrella as it still rains, right? And I remember when I first read this, I was like, wow, this is so amazing. This is like the relationship between grace and law that I'm like trying to understand. And the more I kept thinking about it, the more I realized it doesn't make sense. Because God is not into just modifying behavior. If you notice the scenario, the person's wet, and then he's given an umbrella, and he goes under the umbrella, and he's still wet. Where is there any transformation in there? He's just not under the rain anymore. But now, let's look at another scenario. Imagine you're in the ocean. No water, I mean, wait, a lot of water, you're in the ocean, obviously there's water. No land. <laughs> no land whatsoever. Just in the ocean. How long? No fish, no nothing. It's just water. How long would you live? How long would you live? What was that? Who would live a day? Who would live a week? Who would live a minute? You're not in a boat. Not in a boat. Just you. Just you in the ocean. (laughs) <laughs> that's not good no it's funny because whenever I ask this some people are like oh a minute it's been raises a hand <laughs> I think you will live longer than a minute sir I have faith some people will live some people are like oh I live seven days someone's like oh I live two weeks some people are like oh, I probably would seem like a lot I'm a heavy man All right? I don't try to look it but I got two cement blocks for feet I will straight down the thing is, is that it doesn't matter how long you would stay afloat or if you could swim, because some people swim better than others. The inevitable conclusion is what? You're dying. You're going down. And you will probably try to, with all your might, try to live, try to survive, try to backstroke, try to, I don't know, whatever the technique. At the end of the day, you're going down. Right? In this ocean, in this little like story that we have, is the law of God. It's overwhelming when you try to do it on your own. You may swim better than others, you may look, you may play the part. At the end of the day, the debt is too high. But then Jesus comes along, right? And he doesn't give you a boat. Right? His grace doesn't look that way. Jesus offers his help. If you accept the help, right? Because obviously this is not forced upon anybody. Christ wants a, a genuine relationship. Jesus gives us grace. And this may sound weird at first, but let me explain. Now, don't go around saying Pastor Will is preaching no vision. I'm not. This is just like a little, little thought. The grace of Christ, when it does to us, if you accept, in this scenario, is that it transforms you into a fish. It transforms you into something that you can never turn yourself into. The same way that a sinner is transformed into a saint. It transforms you into something that you can never possibly achieve.
achieve or attain. Just, it's impossible without Christ. If you would have met me 11, 12 years ago and told me I would have been a pastor, I would have laughed probably like you would because I never saw it. In fact, you probably wouldn't even like me. <laughs> you probably would have. I was wild. I don't just use the word I But I'm here literally standing on the grace of Christ. And it's solely by that that I'm still kept how I am. And so God transforms us into this fish. And I've noticed the water never changes, the water never goes away, but our relationship to the water changes. See, without Christ, it's overwhelming. We're going down. You can swim a minute, a week, a month, 60 years. Eventually, you're going down. But the grace of Christ has now changed our relationship to the law. And notice how grace impacts our relationship to the law. Now, we found life in it. Now, there's this dynamic that's happening where I can't live out the law, right? Because I don't find life in it. And it's simply because of grace. Now, when God says, I have prepared good works for you, right, from the foundation of the earth, in Ephesians chapter 2, notice that, that those works that God has prepared for you, they only have, you only have access to them when you're living in this state of grace. Grace is not just, oh, you're forgiven. I'm sure you grace. You know, you should deserve, you deserve that, 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 that belt, but I'm not going to get you the belt this time because that's grace. Grace actually has a face. And it's Jesus. Amen. And because of that relationship, we now, as the past says, are called righteous. Because we have that relationship. So when we look at it, this parable is prophetic. This parable is literally almost like a little cheat sheet where Christ is like giving you a four. four this is great. Four warning. Hey, this is a test coming. And uh, these are the study notes. These are the study notes. How are we living our lives? C.S. Lewis says it best, where he says, every single moment we are making a decision, and that decision is changing everything about us as we are. Not just that, but every, when we make that decision, we're no longer the same person that we were before making that decision. Everything changes also because of the decisions we make. And then he says, we are either becoming more of a heavenly creature or more of a hellish creature. And in every decision, with every step, we're moving towards one of these directions. And it's true. Especially if we believe in the second coming of Christ. If we believe, if we, if we don't believe in the rapture, and we don't believe in, you know, the seven year, whatever, whatever, if we believe that this is the life that we have right now, that means that every decision, every single day matters. We either become more selfless or selfish. There is no in between. And it shows on how we interact with one another. It shows. So, I mean, one of the biggest things as we're, as we're working in the outreach every morning or every day that I'm there, um, we sign people up. If you were to look at our operation, people come in, they come to this window, and they're like, hey, I want to take a shower, I want to get a haircut, I want to do my laundry, I want to see a case manager. Right? Because not only do we try to provide the basic needs, we also have social workers that help them try to end that experience, right? find them homes, find them jobs. And so what's interesting is that they put their names down on the list, and they tell us what they need. Hey, these are this is this is what I need today. I need this. All right, cool. Let's put this thing down. Now this list that we have, we then say, listen for your name, because we're gonna call you. Right? And then they go about. And one thing I've observed, especially this past week, 
is that many times <laughs> when we call, they don't come. They just don't come, right? It happens almost every day. And it's not everyone, but a good majority so just don't come. They come way later in the day. Sometimes to the point where we're like, like, we can't help you. We're literally about to close. Where were you? Oh, I was out of the I was out And it's interesting that they sign up and then they get distracted. Some of them get distracted on immediate wants, right? Immediate wants. I want this. And so they need to go. And they miss out on the calling for the things that they need. And as I was observing this, I'm like, man. And that's when like, the Lord was like, listen, man, don't, don't, don't judge her. Don't, don't think too highly of yourself. Because you do the same thing. There's things in your life that I'm calling you for. And you're getting distracted by the immediate wants around you. When I'm calling you for things that you actually need. And I know for a fact that Christ, if this is his church, which I believe this is his church, amen, there's, there's wants, there's needs that Christ has for his church in this community that's around you. Because these are all outposts. This is not outposts of Christ. This is an outpost of heaven right here in this community. And there's needs. There's needs. There's needs that you can provide. I want to end with this quote that really impacted me. And um, it's from Testimonies of the Church, Volume 6. And it impacted me because when I think of the when I think of the word legacy, I think of I think of the things you want to leave behind. Everybody wants to leave behind a legacy. Everybody wants to leave behind a legacy. Either through the company, they leave the jobs, so they put they name their company after themselves. Right? Some people want to leave a legacy through their children. Right? Some people want to leave a legacy in their artwork. Some people want to leave a legacy in, in any way, shape, or form. And at the root of it, really, it's I don't want to be forgotten. Right? And it's okay to feel that way because it just shows that we were meant to live forever, right? But legacy, we all want to leave something. We all want to leave something. And it's interesting that in this passage, and um, you can find it in Testimonies of the Church, Volume 6, the chapter is called The Need of the Church. And it's so interesting because it follows the chapter before it called The Need of the World. But in the need of the church, she begins in the first paragraph saying that there's a need in the world of sympathy, of prayers, right, of help. But then she mentions there's a need in the church to draw out that sympathy, to draw out those prayers, to draw out that help. So think about it like tug of war. Here you have a world that has needs, and here you have a church that has all the supplies. It needs to be a better distributor, is what she's saying. And in the process of distributing the things that the world needs, that's where our character begins to be built. Begins to be refined. Right? I praise God for these moments that we have to come and, you know, have a worship service. But this is where your character is. It's not refined. It is not refined here. In the Bible studies and small groups, your character is not refined. You're learning almost the bookwork, the values, the study. When you step out into the world, you step out into the community and your values and what you're learning is put to the test, that's when your character begins to build. When people are like, oh, give me patience for this person. He is. That's why he gave me that person. It's very difficult. So as the passage is talking about it, she then says, it's so, so impactful. Right? Talking about legacy. She says the sick, the poor, the suffering, the less fortunate, they are the legacy that Christ has left for his church. 
Let that sink in. The sick, the unfortunate, the suffering, the poor. They are the legacy that Christ has left for his church. So my question is, how are we treating the legacy of Christ? How are we treating it? And I pray that as we begin to move forward, hopefully that the Holy Spirit is kind of like, that's self, you know, we're trying to answer that for me, that's, you need to answer that with God. But how are we treating it? What legacy are we trying to establish in our church? Is it our legacy or the legacy of Christ? And it will be seen, again, in how we treat each other. The church, I pray that as we go through this week, that that's my challenge. That's my challenge. That's my encouragement. That's my, as we go through this week, let's begin to live out these principles that Christ has given us. Let's pray for someone to come into our way that either hungry or thirsty or something that we can do for someone. Right? To live out these principles. To live out a Christ-like life. Right? So that one day when, we, when our Lord and Savior comes back, because He is coming back, the question was again, how will I find Him? He can look at us and be like, I did a faithful servant, well done. Come and have His kingdom. I prepared for you because you've lived out the relationship. You didn't just talk about it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for, for this morning, Lord, for the gift that it is. Lord, for our family here that's come, as we just break bread, Lord, and spiritual bread, Lord. Father, as we go through this passage, as we went through this passage, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit may lead us into all truth in it, Lord. That we begin to see, Lord, that we are actually reading about ourselves. That you so graciously have forewarned us, Lord, of what to do. And all you're asking, Lord, is to actually have a genuine, true relationship that's lived out here on this earth. So, Father, I just pray throughout this week that you may bring people into our lives, Lord, that we can just share, Lord, the gospel, but not with words. But share the gospel by giving food, by giving something to drink, by meeting the need, Lord, by establishing a true and genuine friendship. Father, we thank you for the people you will bring in our lives this week and for the amazing work you will do in this church, Lord, and the impact that will begin to make in this community. So that when, when Brooksville thinks of church, they may look towards Brooksville SDA. I thank you for all these things. I'm here to say that.